Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be here. This is a great opportunity that was given to me for sharing something that is so critical to understand the balance between different ecosystems in our body, the interrelationship we have among them, and what is the connection between those ecosystems and human disease. I'm talking about the oral gut microbiome axis. I've been over the years expanding my knowledge about this topic and I find it fascinating in multiple ways because this is really giving me more clues to understand how to rebalance the gut microbiome in the first place, but also how to bring benefits in terms of solutions to people who are looking for permanent improvement in their bodies, in their, he in their health, and there's something missing. Currently. And that missing piece, it's tightly connected to the balance we have among these two ecosystems, the oral microbiome and the gut microbiome. And I will be sharing a lot of different uh, pieces of information in terms of how these two areas are connected, but also how we can improve the status of these two ecosystems to the point that we can get them in tune, in balance, and in, in sync for providing the proper information for your body cells, for, the, for your immune system, for your microbes in both areas. We're going to be talking a lot about all these things. So let's get us started and let me give you a little bit of a general view of what the microbiome of the mouth looks like. I know that there's a lot of people already talking a lot about the gut microbiome, so I will try to emphasize a little bit more this other area that is not usually very well embraced by the medical community. The oral cavity, it's the second largest and the most diverse microbiota after the gut and has around 700 species of bacteria there, which is a pretty significant amount of bacteria. And also we have, along with the bacteria, we have fungi, we have viruses and protozoa. And the complexity of the mouth, and that was something that really got my attention from the beginning, it's because we have multiple niches inside this cavity. It's not just one ecosystem that behaves in the same way all around. You have multiple different areas that they have different types of ecological conditions that will set a different type of growth pattern for the microbes that are living there. So for example, the sulcus in between the teeth structure and the gums, that has a different a certain types of conditions. Um, it has certain temperature, pH, oxygen levels, and nutrient supply. If you go to the heart pellet, you have a different type of a scenario. If you go to the dorsum of your tongue, you'll have a different type of a scenario. So depending on where you're looking at, you're going to find different composition of microbiomes, but you're going to have different types of environmental settings, and that will dictate what is needed in order for keeping a certain balance and grow, grow a certain pattern of microbes that will provide certain type of functionality. So when we analyze the microbiome, actually, that's a very important topic. We can't just go and analyze it as a whole thing in full. We need to really know this differentiation in terms of the variations of these ecosystems to really understand what we're looking at. That's why most of the times when we look at the analysis of the oral microbiome and we use a salivary test, that is only a fraction of what the microbiome of the mouth really is. And unfortunately, the saliva is not the most stable niche. We're going to be talking about that in a minute. Now, we have 185 genuses and uh, 12 films in the composition of the oral microbiome. We have some of them known, some of them are officially named, and some of them are unnamed, but we know who they are, but, and then other ones that are, we really don't know. We are still trying to figure that out. So there's a lot of room yet to expand the knowledge in the oral microbiome area. And that is actually exciting because this is something that it's growing every single year. And, and we are getting more information and more dots connected around these areas. And it's really fascinating that we are living the experience of bringing more knowledge into this area of the body. And we are understanding how much is connected to everything else that happens in the body. So if you look at the films that are making the microbiome of the mouth, you will see something pretty interesting. And the interesting part is that there's a very important overlap in the composition of the oral microbiome versus the gut microbiome. So you see names there, for example, Firmicutes and Proteobacteria and Actinobacteria and Bacteroides, Spirochetes, and there's a lot of things that we typically see in the gut microbiome as well. So when we analyze the gut microbiome, we can see certain patterns 
especially if we're dealing with translocation, which is something that is pretty common nowadays. We're going to talk about that as well, but note uh, on the side, we need to understand that these bacteria are going back and forth and that the overlap really dictates what is going to be communicated from one area to another. And that overlap really allows a compatibility in terms of the uh, microbes we have in both areas. So they can really talk to each other and recognize as uh, friends, not foes. And, and it's actually pretty important for immunological factors. Now, the oral habitat, this is something that is mind-boggling because I assume completely differently when I start studying more in depth the oral microbiome. You have to understand my background is in periodontist by training. And I knew a lot about the microbiome from my previous training, but not in the level that I was able to grasp when I start studying the connection between the mouth microbiome and the rest of the body. But also, I had some preconceptions about the, the stability of the microbiome in the mouth because this is an open cavity. So I assume, well, it's going to be all over the place because it's getting from everywhere. You open the mouth and you get whatever is around. And yeah, this is not really going to be a really easy place to uh, determining some patterns and studying. And the reality was much deeper. It is one of the most stable microbiotas and has uh, also a really high alpha diversity, as we spoke before, but it is a very stable ecosystem. And why is that? I don't want to spoil what I'm going to say afterwards, but there are some factors that are keeping the stability of the microbiome on the, on the mouth. And if you see this graph over here in, the, in this slide, the tongue dorsum is actually pretty stable, which is fantastic because we rely on the microbiome of, of the tongue dorsum, for example, for making very essential nutrients like nitric oxide and all the conversion of nitrates into nitrites and then the, the passage to them to the rest of the body so they can be converted into nitric oxide relies on having very stable microbiome in the tongue dorsum. But also we have saliva in second place and heart palate and throat. And we have the supragingival plague there, buccal mucosa, and we can keep going. But you can see all of them are pretty high in the spearman correlation, meaning that they have very, very important stability. The higher the spearman correlation, more stable the area we're analyzing. And this applies to all these different niches among the oral cavity. That's really good news if you think about it because we can um, now study the microbiome of the mouth with much more confidence that it can be replicated from one subject to another and we can establish certain patterns that allows us to create a little bit of more predictability in terms of what we're seeing and what can happen if it gets imbalanced. Now, the oral microbiome starts developing early in our lives and the oral microbiome is actually very important because it actually changes through the course of pregnancy meaning that the microbiome of the mouth has a certain role in the development of that newborn baby. So there's a um, transition of the types of microbes that we see in the mouth of the pregnant woman that are related to the development of the fetus, which doesn't occur on non-pregnant women. Now, this, and you know, in the body, nothing happens randomly. Nothing happens just because. This is really preparing, setting the ground for what's going to happen afterwards. And remember that we know that the fetus is not sterile, that we have early colonization and we have the presence of microbes in the placenta. We don't have absence of microbes. We have low diversity, of course. We have very few of them, but still we have presence of microbes in that area. Now, on the other side, the preparation, it's because remember that the vaginal canal, it's one of the first places where we're going to be inoculating the baby to develop a full-grown microbiome later on. And also the oral microbiome is going to be transitioning in the mouth uh, of the mother to pass nutrients and, and, and information and, and a lot of different things that are needed for a healthy development of the newborn that is intimately connected with the gut microbiome function. So the mouth microbiome now changes to adapt to whatever needs to happen in the gut microbiome of the mother so that those changes are passed in a normal expedite an optimized way to that fetus in development. So if we don't see patterns of changes in the oral microbiome of the pregnant women that are compatible with health, we know that there's also adverse outcomes in the pregnancy, like low birth weight and preterm birth and preeclampsia and miscarriages. So definitely the oral microbiome plays a huge role in the development of that new baby. Now, there's passages of uh, bacterial dissemination 
and also the cytokines are re related to the inflammatory conditions that can be set in the mouth of the mother of that uh, baby. And those um, passages can alter the development of the baby in itself. So we know that the um, cytokines like interleukin-6 and interleukin-8, etc., they can travel and go into the placenta and create inflammatory conditions there. And also the bacteria can actually travel through the circulation and colonize there and create a different type of pattern of the colonization, intrauterine colonization for that baby and creating a different type of outcome and put it at risk of the pregnancy of the mother. Now, also we know that we have an important colonization, yet of course it's not as diverse as a full-grown microbiome in an adult, but still we're going to have the presence of microbes in the placenta and the amniotic fluid. And we know that the baby comes in contact with the microflora of the uterus and vagina through the delivery. So there's a complete set of events in terms of early exposure to microbes is going to dictate the development of that baby. And we know that also the mouth of the baby is usually inoculated by the feeding process, breastfeeding, to acquire the oral microflora that will create this ripple effect that will dictate the growth rates and growth patterns of the rest of the microbiome of the GI tract. So it's so important to have a healthy pattern from the beginning. And we know that in a sterile or germ-free mice or antibiotic-treated mice, development of the placenta is actually not quite normal, quite low, if um, there's an absence of microbes compared to normal microbiomes uh, from those mice. And that is a major piece of information because uh, traditionally or very typically we can get pregnant women getting antibiotics, lowering the diversity of their microbiome, and that can actually alter the development of that early placenta that is needed for the feeding process of the fetus. So it's not a minor issue. It's not really an, I should be a light decision giving antibiotics to a mother, if, considering this factor. Now, later in the development, we have seen that children that they get microbes through the oral passage, for example, in this study, they're looking at pacifiers and how parents were cleaning or sterilizing the pacifiers or not before putting them back into the baby's mouth. And they, they saw that if they actually suck the pacifier for cleaning purposes before putting that back in the baby's mouth, those kids that were getting this mouth cleans pacifier were less likely to develop other immune conditions later down in their lives compared to the kids that they got their pacifiers sterilized. So that, that's critical, meaning that we actually rely on the passage of mouth microbes from the parents into their babies to develop an immunological response that is healthy. At least on this study, we can prove at, to a certain extent that statement. And that brings me back to a very important concept, which is oral biofilms. And um, I get a little bit iffy every time I hear the concept of biofilm disruptive agents. I know they're so popular. I know that a lot of people are talking about it, and that seems to be an ultimate solution for any type of dysbiotic condition that you can see along the digestive tract or even away from the digestive tract in the skin, etc. And that is not restricted to the mouth as well. And I've seen the dramatic lowering in the diversity levels of people that are using these biofilm disruptive formulations, especially for a long time, because the ones that are more natural, they don't really are less potent. So they can really create a lot of damage in the biofilms and ultimately they can lower diversity as dramatically as in any type of pharmaceutical antibiotic. But the, when the worst part is that because they are not so regulated because they're coming from natural ingredients, people can use them for months and that can create a very dramatic damage in the biofilms. And the biofilms in the mouth and everywhere else in the body are the most fundamental structure of organization of the microbes that we have inside our body. Those are the commensal microbes we're talking about. Those are the ones that are actually doing something for us. The planktonic forms of bacteria, the ones that are floating around, that they're not organized, they're not able to do much, really. It's, it's not really much they can provide in terms of functionality. It is when you have these aggregations of microbes organized in biofilms that you can actually create metabolically active patterns of microbes that will produce things that are necessary for human health. So the fact that we're going disrupting these biofilms over and over doesn't really make too much sense. What it does make sense is balancing the terrain where these biofilms are living so we can optimize their patterns of growth and diversity and functionality 
to become more benign and more health compatible. It's never about the microbes. It's always about the terrain. So the oral biofilms are these three-dimensional structured communities that they have uh, multiple types of microbes living together. It's not just one type, which is amazing. They communicate, they share things. They, they're pretty promiscuous, actually. They share a lot. And they, they're they embedded in this cell-produced matrix of extracellular polymeric substances. Uh, we call it APS. And this um, creates a little bit of the communication channels are, that are needed for them to talk to each other. And it creates a very stable ground for them to function. And we need them. So... In the mouth, it's actually something that we rely on for producing a lot of things are necessary for staying healthy. We can also actually defend ourselves. This is a major component of the defense systems we have because not only we create immune responses mediated by the information that is passed from the microbes towards our immune system. We also have an active defense mechanism that is established by these stable communities in form of biofilms that are occupying certain niches and defending themselves towards other opportunistic microbes that can go there and colonize. If you disrupt those biofilms all the, all the time, you are creating an open ground for opportunistic colonizers to come in and do something that is not supposed to be done there. So that it's critical. Now, we know that there's certain patterns of colonization within the biofilms. And if you get a certain complexity in terms of the composition of those biofilms that is considered healthy, we are going to be functional and we're going to be fine. But sometimes these biofilms, they get too complex and not so healthy. And that's where things can go in the wrong direction. So that's why we need biofilm modulating agents, not disruptive agents, just modulating agents. Because these biofilms with their own patterns, they can become very aggressive and they can actually give a lot of headaches to membranes or tissues and to the overall inflammatory status of any place that they establish themselves. Now, again, there's some bacteria. For example, there's one highlighted here, which is Fusiobacterium nucleatum. Fusiobacterium nucleatum can be a very nasty bacteria. It's normal in the uh, mouth microbiome a certain amount, but if it goes too high in abundance, it can get very aggressive, more inflammatory in the mouth. It can become one of the transitioning bacteria to develop advanced periodontal disease. The worst part is that if this guy travels to the gut, it creates a huge issue in the gut stability. It's highly inflammatory, and I will talk about that in a minute a bit more, but it, it's not good news when we see pH-bacterium nucleatum present in the gut composition. Now, also, we have another very important fluid in the mouth cavity, which is the saliva. And saliva has uh, a lot of microbes. Now, again, going back to the conversation about analyzing saliva to understand the status of the oral microbiome, I have my concerns. I think we're taking this too seriously in terms of acknowledging that the saliva is representative of the overall composition of the oral cavity and the oral microbiome. I think it's not just like that. It's, it definitely gets a lot of tracent microbes. It gets a lot of planktonic bacteria, and it still is high in the spearman correlation. So it, it's quite stable to a certain extent, but it's not the same type of composition you will see in other areas. Like for example, the gingival sulcus and other, uh, or the dorsum of the tongue. And why I'm mentioning this? Because sometimes we treat things that are going, that are happening in the gums, for example, by using the saliva patterns as an analytic tool for whatever is growing in those areas. Uh, I don't think it's just like that. I mean, it can have certain correlation, but it's not 100% correlated. So if you see presence of certain microbes in the saliva, doesn't imply that the same microorganisms are present in the gums or creating an inflammatory condition there or something else that can be not uh, benign can be pathological. It, it's a little bit of a long shot. And I think that we have to take this in consideration for understanding the extent of how reliable this analytic tool can be. Besides that, in the saliva, we have a lot of proteins, more than a thousand proteins that are making a lot of things, including boosting the immune system function. We have circuitry IgA there. We have host defense peptides. We have things that are balancing the pH, like bicarbonate and phosphate. We have certain amino acids urea, those are used by our microbes, even for as a food substrate. I'm going to mention that in a minute a little bit more. But we have mucins, which are the main sugar source for uh, the bacterial growth. And I'm going to spoil this right away. The, the main role of saliva is actually feeding the mouth microbiome, one of the main ones. So that's why even in this open cavity, so exposed to everything, you still got stability for your microbial patterns because you have a very stable feeding process coming from the secretion of your salivary glands 
along with the curricular fluid, which is coming in between your gums and your teeth. So those two, two fluids are actually providing the nutrients needed for keeping the growth rate stable. It's fantastic because otherwise it would be very random the way we could be feeding our microbes. By the way, we don't have too much food staying in our mouth for too long and they get washed out by the same saliva they, or, or the movement of the tongue or the cheeks. And there will be some areas that you can get more food sometimes and, and, and some areas that will not get anything at all. So the patterns of growth will be dictated by the opportunities of those foods to stay in contact with certain areas. That will be very, very uneven. But in this way, we have a very even, very stable feeding process. And that's how we get the stability for the oral microbiome growth. So this was actually the slide <laughs> I have to... I was going to say that uh, the main source of nutrition of the oral microbiome comes from saliva and curricular fluid, from gut-absorbed nutrients. And these nutrients, they enter the bloodstream and they get concentrated in the salivary glands. And this is known as the enterosalivary circuit. And this is how, again, we keep everything stable in terms of growth rate. The oral bacteria, they can find in with a normal, efficient gut abs nutrient absorption, they can find nutrients that otherwise they will not have the time for breaking them down so they can get fed properly. Now, I just said something that is critical. It is highly important to have good nutrient absorption. That implies two things. We need to eat nutrient-dense foods that will provide the nutrients that can get back into circulation and flushed in these through the salivary glands into the mouth cavity. That's one. And the other things that we have to be competent we have to be efficient enough to break down those nutrients to the point that we can reabsorb them and transport them back into the salivary gland. If we have inefficiencies in the production of hydrochloric acid, if we have inefficiencies in the production of enzymes, if we have inefficiencies in the production of bile, that nutrient absorption is not going to happen in the same way, and therefore we're going to have a deficiency in the nutrient flow to the mouth microbiome. Now imagine the SAP diet with all this, the lack of nutrient that that diet implies. And we see so much prevalence of chronic illnesses in the mouth like cavities and gum disease. Maybe we can explain those diseases not just by the traditional model that something sets in the tooth structure between the gums and it triggers a localized inflammation there. Maybe it's all about a lack of proper feeding to your microbes in the mouth that is triggering these changes in the compositional patterns of the microbiome in the mouth that they become more aggressive and ultimately they establish themselves in certain areas where they start degradating or triggering inflammatory patterns or conditions in the mouth in general. So food for thoughts there. And actually one of the things that caught my attention when I was trying to understand the nutrition of the oral microbiome, because fully honest, never through dental school, this theory that food gets deposited in the sulcus of, or the grooves and beads on the tooth structure of the sulcus in the gums, and that triggers the um, whole thing about periodontal disease or tooth decay, never really makes sense. <laughs> It was not really something that was feeling logical to me. And I'm so happy that at the end of the day, I could find some answers that explain much better for my understanding what happens in terms of oral pathology rather than this localized deposit of a piece of uh, candy that stays in the mouth and the tooth for a while. And, and that's very unlikely, actually. If you think about it, sugar is water soluble. So how long really can stay in, in the tooth structure to create permanent colonization and utilization of those uh, sugars by bacteria and then the acids and etc. It doesn't really make sense. You know you need month for developing a tooth decay process and candy. If you're lucky, it's going to stay three days. And again, another piece of foods or thoughts. And if you have questions, you want to talk about this a little more, I'm, I'm always available for it. But the main thing that got my attention initially was the nitric oxide cycle. So the nitric oxide cycle, it's uh, very interesting because it tells a story about how nitrates coming from foods uh, that are rich in nitrates, they go back to the gut and the stomach, they get reabsorbed, they go back to the, the salivary glands, they get accumulated there, they get flushed. Now oral bacteria break them down and transform the reduction process there from nitrates to nitrites. And that's how we keep going down and then we feed and we transform those nitrates ultimately into nitric oxide that is so relevant for cardiovascular health and but for many, many other things. Immunologically, 
immunological functions and neurological functions, etc. So this was the first molecule I had information about that is, was really proven to recirculate from the gut back into the salivary glands. So the question mark that raised got in my head right away was, well, if this happens for nitrates, can it happen for something else? And the answer was, yes, it does. And so that's how I, I figured out the way that we can feed our microbiome in a very stable form. So summarizing a little bit my thought process here. So if we see the gut, for example, when we have modifications in the nutrient availability, and usually people who are more carb restricted, they're not feeding their microbiome properly and up there. And then these microbes are going after the mucosal layer, the mucin 2 layer, to get an alternative food source that allows them to survive. So we deplete the mucosal layer because these microbes, now that they're starving, they go after that mucin 2 layer in the gut. In the same way, if we're not really feeding our oral microbes through this enterosalivary circuit and bringing the nutrients needed for them to grow stable enough and be happy and well-fed, maybe that's why they go after secondary sources of nutrients. Now, where do you get those nutrients? The same niche as I just mentioned. The groups and bits of the tooth structure, they are tightly connected to the dentin, which has organic matter there, the 50% organic. So you can get proteins there, glycans and other sources of nutrients that those microbes can utilize for survival reasons. And in the gums, well, they have all this connective tissue where you get all this curricular fluid and maybe in the same way they start getting deeper, trying to find more food sources. So at the end of the day, maybe tooth decay or periodontal disease, they have one common root cause, which is oral microbes starving, looking for alternative food sources and getting deeper and changing their compositional patterns and getting deeper into those tissues, trying to find food where it's uh, available because they're not getting those foods from the normal route, which will be the enterosalivary circulation. Now, what will happen if and those people that they are going through chronic periodontitis or going through extensive tooth decay issues. What happens if we just bring those nutrients back to them through the salivary glands? We'll see. I don't have the answer for that. <laughs> I wish I had. So where comes this oral gut microbiome connection? Well, since the mouth is positioned as the gateway for the entry of the GI tract, and he's performing some of the most vital functions for human life. It's all connected, and he has a tremendous influence in many body processes. And the dysbiosis in the oral microbiome is linked to a very high number of local and systemic diseases, and we know that. So there's no argument that the oral microbiome drives uh, health and disease in the rest of the body. And in this slide, we can see that how briefly, how it could be connected to multiple types of um, health conditions. And of course, the obvious ones are the periodontitis and caries, but also we have things as diabetes or pancreatic cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, esophageal cancer, colorectal cancer, cystic fibrosis, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease. And I can keep going. I can tell you non-alcoholic fatty liver and liver cirrhosis. Those things are actually connected to a dysbiotic pattern in the mouth microbiome that's triggering inflammatory conditions which will set the ground for these pathologies to occur. So that's not really a minor thing. Now, there's two main ways that this can happen. One is that the oral microbes are producing cytokines and they're traveling through the bloodstream and they get into the systemic circulation and they act in different places in the body, triggering all these inflammatory diseases, related diseases. That's one thing. The other way is that the microbes are traveling directly. So they go there in the bloodstream and they travel to different places in the body and they set certain conditions in other places to trigger inflammation. And there's actually a third way, which is not listed here, which is translocation. So now we're swallowing microbes, and those microbes are supposed to get killed by the stomach acid barrier, but because we have a tremendous epidemic of hypochloridia, now this barrier is not filtering the microbes properly enough. They're traveling, and they're getting into the gut, and now they are triggering multiple types of inflammatory conditions. They're creating also certain byproducts and metabolites that are not supposed to be made in those areas, and they trigger all these other type of uh, issues in the gut now. And this is something that most, most of the times is not really well described, but it's actually one of the main reasons we have SIBO. 
SIBO, when we look at SIBO, it is actually more about translocation of microbes from the mouth into the gut, into the small bowel, rather than microbes cl climbing up from the colon into the small bowel, which is actually very unlikely to happen. You need to have a dysfunctional sphincter there, which is only 5%, I think, or 10% of the population that may have that dysfunction, uh, a sphincter that connects the colon to the small bowel. So I think the other route makes much more sense to my belief. Now, we know that we are swallowing 140 billion bacteria and we produce a liter of saliva daily. And that goes into our digestive tract. But again, it's all about the barriers. If we have a lot, we have a normal production of stomach acid. If we have a normal production of bile, we can keep this control. But those are the two main fluids that we see challenges right now in terms of filtering what's supposed to be or not supposed to be getting there. If we get either translocation or we get the circulation of microbes from the mouth into, the, into other areas like the gut, or we get the cytokines or the inflammatory molecules created in the mouth in the first place, we're going to start seeing certain conditions. One of the conditions we see pretty connected between the oral microbiome and the gut microbiome is inflammatory bowel disease, which is a very big concern in the medical community nowadays. And we know that certain periodontal pathogens, for example, Porphyromonas gingivalis and future bacterial nuclei, and I told you about future bacterial nuclei, it's going to come a lot in this conversation. They can travel and they can trigger inflammation in the gut. Also, Porphyromonas gingivalis can actually lead to disorders in the microbial community structure of the intestines. And it can create a destruction in the intestinal barrier, which will induce endotoxemia by the increased passage of lipopolysaccharides from the gram-negative bacteria living there, plus the fact that all these microbes that are getting into the gut from the mouth are mainly gram-negative, so you're going to have a raise in the levels of gram-negatives you can find in the gut now, and that will create a higher inflammatory response. And that can trigger IBS or an IBD. Now, fusion bacterial nucleatum can also migrate to the intestines. And when it migrates, it's related to so many things. Not only IBD, it's for millions of other things. And it's a very aggressive bacteria when it gets into the gut. But one of the things that can do, actually, is inhibit the immune response that is mediated by T cells. And, and of course, that blocks the proper regulation of the immune system. We have an imbalance between Th1, Th2, and that throws inflammation full throttle into the gut, and that will trigger a lot of uh, issues and destruction in the tissues of the intestines, and that leads to IBD and IBS. And Fusobacterium nucleatum, Fusobacterium in general, is not something we think about or we guess about. We can actually have analysis of the gut microbiome and determine if we have presence of certain microbes from the mouth in, in the gut. And here, for example, you see Fusobacteria highly elevated. And this is not supposed to be in the gut in the first place. There's not really a range of healthy abundance for these future bacteria in the gut. It doesn't supposed to be there at all. And if it's there and in high amounts, we have a problem. And a lot of people are questioning the relevance of testing the gut microbiome. If you can properly connect the dots and you understand the physiological pathways involved in the presence of certain microbes in the gut and the triggering of certain immunological responses or the balance between them that can push pathways in one direction or the other, this is a fantastic. But it doesn't give you information just digested or pre-digested. You need to really focus and study and understand this to be able to squeeze the last drop of information from this type of tools. With that being said, this is a fantastic tool that allows me to understand a lot about what's going on in the person's health. Uh, if you also see Fermi, it's quite elevated for this person, acting the bacteria and, future, and protobacteria. And I mentioned before that some of the main films that are making the oral microbiome are actually Firmicutes, Actinobacteria, and Protobacteria, and those are now highly elevated in the gut. And I told you before that you can get translocation of those microbes if you don't have a proper production of hydrochloric acid and bile. Maybe we're seeing a pattern here. Maybe this person is deficient in the production of all these fluids, allowing it a higher translocation and therefore a higher presence of these microbes in the gut. And if you go to the next slide, you will see that the family level analysis is showing that Fusobacterium is elevated, but also we have things like uh, Enterobacteriaceae or um, Ectorolaceae, and these are actually mouth microbes as well. So when we start seeing these patterns, I start getting very suspicious that we have translocation going. Now, the other thing that we, we have observed in people with IBD is that they do have different patterns on the oral microbiome. So we analyzed oral microbiome patterns and we compare that with people with IBD or not, people or people without IBD, and they have a different type of composition in the mouth microbiome. And we see there's a certain dominance of groups 
are not typically dominant in the mouth microbiome to begin with, especially in Aceria and Haemophilus and Veonella. So, um, it's probably to call because I'm privy tell as well can change, but I, I will be more concerned about Aceria and Haemophilus and Veonella. There could be quite more inflammatory uh, for triggering uh, IBD later on. And also, again, there's more oral derived microorganisms that can be detected in the intestinal mucosa and feces of patients with IBD which is uh, supporting everything I just said in terms of translocation. Now, the oral microbiome and liver disease are quite connected because there's, first of all, a difference between the tongue flora that has been found in research in people that has a liver cancer and healthy people. The oral flora of patients with liver cancer is definitely more diverse, but not in the right direction because diversity seems to be always a good thing. But you want to have diversity with the right types of microbes. If you have high diversity with the wrong types, it's not going to really pay off. And the patterns of composition also are not the same. And we know also that the pathological state of the oral microbiome, like the one you will find in periodontitis, it can become a risk factor for creating non-alcoholic fatty liver. And remember, this is a reminder from something we spoke before, your mouth relies on your gut of nutrient absorption to stay healthy, among with other things, of course. But that's one of the main things. And if you have periodontitis, that means that something was going on also in the gut. So it's actually more a vicious circle rather than something that started in the mouth and got translocated into the gut. It's actually something that happened probably in both areas or maybe just the gut initially and then travel and affected the mouth and then the mouth start affecting the rest of the body and you get this overall vicious circle that is hard to step out of. And, and the good thing is now, if we know how this works, we can actually do something to step out of this vicious circle. Well, that's why I get so excited about it. And we know that patients with liver cirrhosis, they have a large number of oral microorganisms in their gut, and in, including Bionella, Streptococcus, Frivotella, Haemophilus, Lactobacillus, Crostridium, things that we mentioned before. So we are now seeing presence of microbes from the mouth in the intestinal microbiome, and this invasion can trigger liver cirrhosis. And even more, P. gingivalis, Porphyromonas gingivalis, can change the composition, again, of the intestinal microbiome. Remember, I mentioned this before in IBD. Increases permeability of the intestinal mucosum, and it can spread bacteria to the liver. So now you have inflammation in the liver created by increased permeability that was triggered by a known periodontal pathogen that allows the integration, the passage of bacteria into the liver tissue, and that derives into an increased amount of triglycerides in the liver tissue, which you know is highly associated, and it's creating damage. So it's a huge thing. It's a huge deal. It's not a minor issue. Now, what about cancer? So we know that uh, the oral microbiome has a great influence in the tumor proliferation and the invasion and metastasis. We, we know that everything is connected there. Remember that cancer, it is in a very advanced inflammatory condition. And the inflammation can be triggered hugely by an imbalance in the oral microbiome. Now, there's cytokines that can travel from the mouth that can trigger tumor formation. Also, they can be created in the mouth itself. So it's all both local and systemic, the implications of these elevated numbers of cytokines. And that we know that even in some cases, we can use oral microbes to be used as a potential biomarker for studying oral cancers and see if we can de detect them earlier than standard methodology. Also, we know that certain microbes like Fusobacterium nucleatum can migrate into the intestines and trigger inflammation there that can be ultimately developed into colorectal cancer. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, a little bit more in detail. I just, just want to mention here in this slide that there's more than just liver or oral cancers, proliferation by, proliferation by uh, oral microbiota in inductions. We're going to talk a little more in detail. about The cardiovascular disease, It's this is one of the most widely known connections. Uh, we know that cytokines are released by periodontal pathogens, including interleukin-6 and tumoral necrosis factor alpha. They can go into the blood circulation and create inflammation in the vascular endothelial areas, and, and that is one of the triggers of the arteriosclerotic plagues at the end of the day. So, of course, we want to be aware that that migration of cytokines can be linked to cardiovascular disease. And it's way more into that, but for now, we just want to mention that inflammation in the mouth can be resulting into inflammation in the cardiovascular system. Alzheimer's disease, we have studies that they have been done for people with Alzheimer's disease, and they see a correlation between the amount of tooth loss or the extension of the periodontal disease and 
the cognitive impairment. So the more damage in the mouth due to chronic conditions in the mouth, like periodontal disease and potentially tooth decay, can be related to the extent of the cognitive impairment we're seeing in this people. So we know there's a correlation. And also it's um, speculated that the oral microbes can affect directly the brain tissue just by the, again, translocation of cytokines or by actually passage of periodontal microorganisms through the central nervous system. We can use the peripheral nerves and they can go from the trigeminal nerve or the glossopharyngeal nerve and they can get into the brain actually. And we know that the brain somehow is not sterile as we, as we thought. And that because the same same things that can affect the membranes in the gut can affect the membranes that are protecting the brain, we can have leaky brain and, and that can affect the way we are creating these barriers against the translocation of microorganisms there. Now, I mentioned the, the Fusobacterium nucleatum translocation, and I want to connect this a little bit with hydrogen sulfide. And this is something I don't know, I think is missing in the SIBO conversation. We are demonizing hydrogen sulfide so much. But the reality is that hydrogen sulfide, it's highly necessary for a healthy metabolism of the colonocytes. So it happens that the colonocytes, they produce hydrogen sulfide inside their cells, and that's needed for normal mitochondrial function. So that's how we replicate the tissues and how we keep the integrity of the allicines in the tight junctions so we keep everything stable there. But if we start getting too much hydrogen sulfide from the outside, the exogenous production, that can actually block the respiratory cycle of the colonocytes. And it can create the opposite. We have a low repairing rate. We have leakingness of the gut. And this, over time, can get transformed into IBS, IBD. We're talking about hydrogen sulfide produced by exogenous bacteria, different from Fusobacterium nucleatum. Now, if Fusobacterium nucleatum gets into the equation, along with all these other microbes that are increasing the production of hydrogen sulfide, now we have a more severe determinating factor. So now from IBS, IBD, we can progress into colorectal cancer. That's the risk scenario that is posed by the presence of Fusobacterium nucleatum in the gut, that it can it can worsen the evolution of an inflammatory condition in the gut from just inflammation, chronic inflammation, which is still a lot, to cancer. That has been proven, and we have good studies done that they are stating this type of issues in how relevant it is to know how much hydrogen sulfide we're getting from endogenous and exogenous sources. Here's an, actually in the schematic, you can see cytokines arriving and small amounts of mucosal integrity is there, and we are producing hydrogen sulfide here, activating enzymes and leading to a healthy turnover of the metabolism in the mitochondria or of the colonocytes. Now, we add a couple of more organisms that are able to reduce hydrogen sulfide outside. Now we start getting the mucus layer more disintegrated, more damaged, and now we start getting inflammation inside the colonocyte. But now we add to the same scenario, we add fusobacterium nucleatum, and now we get neoplasia. So that's pretty, pretty significant. We also know that there's an opposite route. So gut pathogens and lipopolysaccharides can actually affect the status of the mouth. So we can get damage in the mouth structure, especially the alveolar bone, and this is highly associated with periodontal disease, when we get translocation of either pathogens or lipopolysaccharides or other inflammatory molecules that are passed through the enteric circulation because we have a leaking problem in the gut barrier, and now this travels to the mouth cavity, creating inflammation there. So it's bidirectional. Now, I will say mostly it's the mouth dictating the status of the gut rather than the gut dictating in the status of the mouth in terms of inflammatory molecules, but still is something that we have to consider when we look at the mouth and we see inflammation there. Now, what we can do about it, and, and this is the main question, like we have all these set of potential scenarios that can happen and all these negative outcomes, and we really want to do something. We were already motivated, I believe, hoping that already more aware of how relevant this this area is, this connection is. So the problem is one thing that we have now, and this um, unfortunately is super embedded into people's mind, this is the oral hygiene paradigm. And because people think that cleaning more the mouth is better, and that's actually not true, because you over cleansing allows disruption of the oral microbes, and we know that disrupting microbes all the time can lead to imbalanced patterns and therefore affecting the healthy metabolism of these microbes that are necessary for creating all this metabolism that are needed for human health. So not really a good idea. We need somehow certain amount of cleaning protocol in the mouth, but not really something that over cleans or 
and especially when we start using antiseptic mouthwashes. We know just something that's super clear through the research that has been done over the years, that if you use antiseptic mouthwashes, for example, based on thorexidin, they will imbalance the nitrate, nitrite, nitric oxide pathway, and they can actually increase the risk of mortality in people who already have certain problems, certain cardiovascular issues. But also you can affect cardiovascular system on its own and promote high blood pressure in patients and people that they were normal tense before using an antiseptic mouthwash. So we know that dis disrupting the mouth microbiome on a permanent basis using antimicrobials can impair a lot of the pathways that are needed for human health. And that is not restricted to nitric oxide. This is all about everything else, like all the communication pathways. Imagine all these microbes now talking to your gut microbiome that is going to tell your immune system what to do. But there's a communication. There's an ongoing conversation going on in between the mouth and the gut microbiome. If you start affecting this communication in one way or the other, if you start lowering the amount of microbes that can potentially pass this information on a healthy way to your gut microbiome, now you impair the whole communication system for the immune system to function normal. Remember, the immune system doesn't know what's going on needs someone to tell the story of what's going on out there. And that is one of the main roles of these mouth microbes that are getting passed in a dead form, in healthy conditions, towards the gut microbiome. So more studies about antiseptic mouthwashing, the evidence anti antihypertensive and vascular protective effects of arginine, which is the vascular production is necessary for the muscular and uh, endothelial production of nitric oxide. So yes, it affects everything in multiple ways. This is uh, something I will stop for a second. This is not too technical, but it's so critical. It's so profound. Every day in the morning, what I do is I start my day by drinking a glass of water with fresh squeezed lemon juice. And then it seems like totally disconnected from what we're talking about. But I told you before that one of the best ways for keeping your mouth microbiome healthy status is by promoting healthy digestion. And we do start our day usually with a cup of coffee or with a bagel and it just havoc just messes up with the entire digestive system for the rest of it. If you just change your routine in the morning and you start with a nice clean glass of water with lemon juice and you wait a little bit before eating your first meal, it's going to be a completely different experience. Simple things can have a profound impact in your health. And we just try to diminish the extent of benefits because they're not so fancy, so cool looking, so weird names uh, related, doesn't matter. Nature is simple. And so sometimes the solutions that are needed for maintaining health, period. That's my belief. Now, one of the other things that I always recommend, detoxification. Detox first, detox always, detox forever. We live in a world that we're exposed to a lot of toxins. Now, how this is related? Because we have a tremendous amount of research relating the imbalances in the mouth microbiome, gut microbiome, with the presence of toxins. If you want to rebalance your mouth and your gut microbiome and your gut and microbiome terrain, you need to remove the blocking or altering agents that can be present. And you know there's a lot of toxins that are actually forever chemicals or persistent pollutants. So they're not just going to fade away in a couple of hours or days. And sometimes we need to become more proactive so they can get eliminated better. And so we can regain this balance in the terrain conditions that are necessary, balance growth of the oral and gut microbiome. Now, I use probiotics and prebiotics and, and postbiotics with common sense. I will say that I'm very excited about the utilization of spore-based probiotics just because we're really using the quorum sensing abilities of microbes to try to rebalance to the best, best of their potential the microbiome uh, of the, the areas that they're getting exposed to. So that can provide benefits to the mouth microbiome along with the gut microbiome. We don't even need some of these microbes to become full-grown bacteria. Actually, some of them in this sporulated state, they can produce antimicrobials that can balance uh, uh, certain microbes in, in different areas, including the skin and the mouth. So we have a lot of usage for this type of probiotics, and I think they can provide a lot of benefits overall. And of course, again, fixing the gut means improving the mouth. So it's completely connected. Uh, we have also vitamins that are critical for improving the mouth uh, and the gut microbiome. But in this case, I will mention the 3K2. I'm, of course, the, the vitamins are incredibly important for immune regulation, but also for the repairing and the growth of the alveolar bone and, and prevent uh, early reabsorption of, of the alveolar bone and due to different conditions. So uh, vitamin D is critical and we don't really get enough. I'm not really a huge fan of super high doses of uh, vitamin D. I like to just keep a consistent intake of a normal amount. I'm talking about maybe a thousand international units daily, which I know is not as much, 
But if you're consistent, it's better than just trying to get 10,000 once a week. And, and I think that's not really the way that we should get vitamins in the first place. And that's a different conversation, by the way. The other thing is the K2 vitamin. So K2 has a tremendous impact in the health condition of the tooth structure. The reason why is because um, we, uh, along with, of course, keeping the process of mineralization in the bone and keeping the integrity of the bone growth in the mouth, we also know that it works in the central nervous system as a signaling molecule and can keep the dental fluid flow moving in the right direction. So we have a centrifugal flow of this dental fluid. And if that gets stopped, or reversed, that can actually lead to a loss of minerals from the tooth structure. Actually, we know that if the flow goes in the right direction, you can grab minerals from the environment. But if the flow goes in the opposite direction, you can actually start demineralizing the tooth structure. Now, this is, again, signaled by K2. That means that we need a good supply of K2 to maintain this centrifugal flow in the dental fluid and a normal absorption of minerals to preserve the tooth structure. We can put all the minerals in the world, but if we don't have the proper movement of the, and integration of them into the matrix of the tooth structure, they're not going to do much. So all this conversation about hydroxyapatite might be relevant or other minerals that can promote a remineralization in the tooth structure is only relevant if all the other nutrients are present. Just another tip for taking care of your your mouth health. I do like to support the digestive system as much as possible, and there's so many tools we can use for that. Digestive bitters, hydrochloric acid, enzymes. We can use certain botanicals and ginger. I love ginger. I love artichoke extract. I love pretty much all the digestive bitters are fantastic for promoting healthy pathways in your digestive system. All the prokinetics, we can have DGL, also is another big one. So there's a lot of tools available out there. We can use infusions, teas, on a frequent basis. They're easy, they're gentle, they're and expensive and they do work. We can use tinctures, like I mentioned before. We can use even homeopathics if we are knowledgeable about it. And they all will promote in different uh, steps and different phases of your digestive system functions to improve the way that we break down nutrients, we absorb the nutrients, and we integrate these nutrients towards our body or towards our microbiome. And side note here, we have two segments in the intestinal tract. One is the small bowel and the other one is the large intestine. They do different things. In a high protein fat diet, you're feeding only the portion that is related to the small bowel. You're neglecting the feeding process to the colonic bacteria. That's not the opposite, also, is not a good thing. We have different segments to produce and perform different functions. We need to respect those. If we push too much on one side and we neglect the other, we create an imbalance. Nothing that creates imbalance is health. So I'm not a huge fan of these very, very extreme diets that are being pushed out there just because they're only focusing on one piece of the puzzle. And yes, cellular nutrition, it is important. Our body nutrition is important, but our body doesn't function without our microbes. So we need to be, feed, be, be able to feed both. So again, Prokinetics, any tool that you feel comfortable using and can promote better digestive pathways. And the other thing is that how we clean our and, and we have a problem really uh, in terms of cleaning because we are relying too much on uh, cosmetics like toothpaste and mouthwashes. There's a study done many years ago, probably in my early years of dental school, where they compared people that were brush brushing their teeth with with only with the toothbrush and people that were brushing their teeth with toothbrush, toothbrush plus toothpaste. There was absolutely no difference at the end of the day. After two, three, week, three weeks, they did an assessment in the status of the mouth and it was completely the same, meaning that toothpaste is mainly cosmetic. And by the way, it brings so much other chemicals and detergents and things that can be disruptive and, and damaging for your body in general that uh, is something I don't really recommend unless it's naturally based, but we have to be careful because they can put a lot of essential oils and essential oils can be also huge in terms of antimicrobial properties. So you want something nice if you want to get some cosmetic addition to your toothbrushing routine, but the really the important tool here is um, mechanical removal of the gross plate without an intentional disruption of the biofilms. So that's one thing I really, really care about. There's um, a product that um, I've been talking about that is formulated based on enzymes that can actually reduce the buildup of biofilms without completely destroying them. And that's something I, I think it could be a good tool when you're dealing with a certain degree of uh, inflammatory condition or disease in the mouth, because we want to really modulate the expression of these biofilms. At the end of the day, remember, 
the way you feed your microbiome in the mouth is the key piece for balancing your oral microbiome. Other things can be that can be relevant, the breathing patterns. If you're breathing by your mouth, turbo is going to affect your microbiome 100% in the mouth, something that should be assessed and addressed with priority. And the other thing that I always recommend, chew your foods. It's absolutely impossible. You're going to get proper absorption of nutrients if you're not chewing. And so many people are eating on the run and they're not taking their time for eating or they're eating with their cell phones or screen in the front and they're not really appreciating the moment they're getting their meals. And if you don't go into that process, you're not stimulating your autonomic nervous system properly, then you're not promoting the production of the things that you need to utilize those nutrients and you're getting a lot of waste. Food, especially good food, is not really cheap to be wasting is just because you want to watch your Instagram while you're eating. I, I think that's really pay off. <laughs> now, uh, last uh, thing before finalizing, we talk a lot about uh, the oral microbiome and the question that I get a lot is, well, what about oral probiotics? Well, there's such a, certain bacteria that we are researching about. We know they might provide some benefits, but up to today, we don't have a really consistent piece of information that is telling us that probiotics can be a dramatic positive input for uh, rebalancing the oral microbiome. Hopefully they will. But I think now we need to focus more on the other aspects I just mentioned, rather than trying to put more bacteria in the mouth that can potentially be beneficial. I, I think that, of course, we need to eat living foods, but probiotic, we don't know really if it's going to do. So we need to evaluate this a little bit more. Now, if we're going to get an oral probiotic just because we want to try it and see if it works, it needs to be sure. It doesn't make any sense to take a capsule form of an oral probiotic. It really does. It's a contradiction. So finally, to finish, I'll give you some brief notes. Avoid over cleansing. Avoid antimicrobial agents uh, in mouthwashes and toothpaste. If you think that you have a brief breathing problem, please evaluate with a specialist. Try to improve your lifestyle the best of your abilities to lower your oxidative stress, to improve healthy inflammatory patterns. Try to remove whatever is in the mouth that was placed before in a safe way. For sure, please, in a safe way, period. There's no other way to remove heavy metals from the mouth, but remove them in the best way you can as soon as possible and with the right timing when they're already placed in the mouth. Try to keep a checkup with your dentist, but try to find a good biological dentist. They know a little bit more about this integration of the oral microbiome with the rest of the body, so they will take care of this area much better. That's what I think. And take care of your diet, because what you will eat at the end of the day will feed not only you, but your microbiome. So keep in mind this relationship between the structures and functions on the oral microbiome and the rest of the balance in human health. It's becoming more and more clear that we have a very important part of our microbiome posted in the mouth, which will lead to a lot of things that can be beneficial or not, depending on how well we take care of this area of the body. And try to do as much as you can to keep this regulated balance because at the end of the day we saw the balance in your mouth microbiome it's the balance of the rest of your body they're completely connected so that's it that's what i wanted to show you today and um, hopefully you enjoy the presentation that gives you relevant information that you can utilize for taking action improving your health and you the people around you and if you have questions you want to connect with me my information is in this slide and i'm always open to create more links with people interested in this this area which fascinates have a great day. Hopefully, I will talk to all of you again in a new opportunity. Thanks.